feel like it was my home church anymore. And we kind of were feeling mutual about that. So we went on a journey, you know, to do that. And uh, she did that. We, we were once, we were looking for a place to live, couldn't find it for a year, finally found this place in Irwin, didn't know it was going to be two minutes from the church. That's God. That's just God. We couldn't figure out why we couldn't find the place. We looked every week all year that God had that, and he was reserving that for us. He knew we were going to be the next tenants in that house because he needed us. And he knew I'd forget a lot of things, so I'd be able to run home and get it real quick, <laughs> like my music or my notes or whatever. My guitar, I did that one time. Oh, I think I need my guitar today. So, uh, but anyway, God's good, you know, and Diane spoke that to me. So what do you think, what do you think we're supposed to do? Like, what's our, what's our, what's God doing? Like, she's always prayed that. She's always trusted God for direction I have too, you know. But I, and I said to her, I said, I don't know. I just, know, I think we just need to trust God and pray. And that same week, that same week, we got a phone call from Pastor Cindy about filling in in September. And then right after that, that same week, we got a call to go to McClellanton to fill in as interim worship leaders for four months. And that four months filled that time. And then when we were done with that, Pastor Cindy called Diane and said, well, and we came down here and talked to the board, and they hired her. And then they told me that I was going to be helping with the youth, and I was terrified. Because <laughs> I'm 57 years old at the time, or whatever it was. I'm like, what? I didn't even do that when my kids were in youth. So... But, uh, but, yeah, sometimes we ask ourselves that, what, you know, what's our purpose? That's probably, you know, a question that's been on your mind before, if I'm right, you know. So, but I believe in, a, it's a few things I thought about, and I wrote these down here. And, um, and I, I believe that we're formed. We're especially formed to know God and to love him. And we're formed for God and for family and for fellowship. I believe that he, he loves us when, when we get together. You know, the Bible says that Jesus was the first of many brethren. You know, he was the first. And, and, and he loves that when we fellowship together, and, and he wants us to commune with him. And to become like Christ. I think that's very important, that one of our purposes should be to become like Christ. Follow his example. Read his word and follow after him. So we're shaped to serve him. And the one question I asked, like, I wonder if you're asking this question, like, what do I do? How do I serve them? And the first thing that came to mind is serve others. And didn't he say, like, if you give a cup of water to the least of these, you've done it to me, right? So when we serve others, we're serving him. And that's the short. But um, I do want to read some, uh, something out of the Bible. I want to read Proverbs 4, 1 through 7. And this is actually in those... It's the same version. So if you guys want to open, I'll give you a second to open to Proverbs 4, verse 1 through 7. And this is a good message, and I've read this many times. This is good to, when you're, when you're seeking God and wanting to serve God. So this is a father's wise advice. It says, my children, listen when your father corrects you. Pay attention and learn good judgment, for I am giving you good guidance. Don't turn away from my instructions. For, for I, too, was once my father's son, tenderly loved as my mother's only child. My father taught me, take my words to heart, follow my commandments, and you will live. Get wisdom. Develop good judgment. Don't forget my words or turn away from them. Don't turn your back on wisdom, for she will protect you. Love her, and she will guard you. Getting wisdom is the wisest thing you can do. And whatever else you do, develop good judgment. I wish I'd have read that when I was a teenager. <laughs> I always respected my mom and dad, and, and it was just the way we were raised. But I didn't respect them enough to sneak around and do things that I know that they wouldn't have been pleased with me to do. And, um, and I do, I really do wish that I started younger when I was your age, when I was younger than you even. Um, there's one more. You don't have to turn to this. This is just real short. This is out of Ecclesiastes 12. It says, don't let the excitement of youth cause you to get your, I'm sorry, let me start it over. Don't let the excitement of youth cause you to forget your creator. Honor him in your youth before you grow old and say life is not pleasant anymore. Remember him before the light 
of the sun, moon, and stars is dim in your old eyes, and rain clouds continually darken your sky. It almost sounds like we're all heading to a bad place. But I think what it's saying there, I think it's just, it's simply saying, don't wait till it's too late. Don't wait till life has passed you by and miss out on opportunities that God has. Because I do believe they're all formed in his likeness. They're formed to serve him and, 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 and live for him. And he wants us uh, to do well. He wants us to make wise choices. At this point, I'm just going to, I'm sorry I wasn't holding this. It was probably loud enough anyway. So. Um, at this point, I want to just uh, try to give a real quick testimony. And my testimony, there's so many testimonies and stories I could tell from the time I was a kid till now, really. But I think as soon as PJ asked me to do this, I, it's just immediately I felt like I'm going to talk about my childhood. <laughs> I'm going to talk about being a teenager and where that, the path that I was on. So it didn't start out real good for me. When I was a kid, I was one of seven. I was the middle son. And I was the only one that my mother decided not to send to kindergarten. <laughs> it was an experiment, she told me later in life. It didn't work out too well. So I went straight to first grade. All the boys were this much taller than me. So you can imagine how that went. So I didn't do real good right off the bat. I had to relive first grade again. A little bit better the second year. But I think from that beginning, just that rough start that I got, I really struggled. I struggled academically. I struggled with math and reading and all that stuff. And I did poor in school. I did lousy. I mean, I got bad grades most of the time. I honestly don't know. I had a lot of credits, I guess. I don't know how I moved on from class to class, but I did. Fast forward a little bit um, up to about eighth grade. Um, I, I finally felt like, ah, you know, I'm doing something I really enjoy. So I joined the football team. And I was good at it. I really enjoyed it. I enjoyed the camaraderie and, and, and you know, with the, the other guys on the team. And uh, so I felt like I had a purpose then. Like maybe this is my purpose, you know. So I did that for a while. And, um, but along with that and those guys that I hung out with, I got involved in some pretty bad stuff. They weren't the best crowd to hang out with. You know, very egotistical people and very headstrong. When it came to Christians, they were just like, you know, no. So it was also that same year I started drinking. And I enjoyed it. And the Bible says there's pleasure in sin for a time, for a season. But the end leads to destruction. And I'm living testimony of that. It was fun at first. It was great, you know, we'd go to parties, we'd dancing and all that kind of stuff. I mean, it was great. But then as time went on, I drank more and more. Didn't get a lot of sleep. Had to wake up, go to school with a migraine headache. You know, all of a sudden it wasn't fun anymore. But I became more or less addicted to it. Like there wasn't a year, a day, or a week went by that I didn't drink. And I got in a lot of trouble because of it. I was in car wrecks. You know, the funny thing is, it wasn't even me. There was one car wreck I was in when I was 16. I crashed my mom and dad's car. Totally annihilated me. I was drunk. After that, I was in other accidents with friends that were drinking. And I, I honestly, guys, <laughs> there's a multiple times when I could tell you I should have died. And I would, I'd have gone to hell because I didn't know God. I wasn't living for him. And um, but it was bad, you know. When I, I made it somehow through high school. I graduated high school. Greatest day of my life. Yay. Got through high school. But at the time... At that time, I just started dating this girl. So for like a year out of high school, I was dating her. And I, we were real close. And I thought that I was, we were going to get married. I really did. And then one day, and what I decided to do is, you know, I got buckled down. And the funny thing is, I didn't really learn to read at all <laughs> well until after I graduated high school. But I was determined then that I need to do something with my life because I had a purpose. So first my purpose was football. And then it kind of faded. And then my purpose was her. Ah, I'm going to live for her. I'm going to. Buckle down and get a great job, and, you know, we're going to get married. So we were together for a year. Right before I started school, my training, she broke up with me and went back with her old boyfriend. <laughs> broke my heart. I know some of you have experienced that already, you know, and it hurts. So all of a sudden, well, I thought that was my purpose. I thought she was what I was supposed to, you know. 
And so from that time on, fast forward again, I'm 19 years old. Between 19 and 23, almost 24, the economy was bad back in those days. I couldn't get a job anywhere. I, had, I worked for a brother-in-law for $5 an hour under the table. Still drinking, still drowning my sorrows, you know. My dad passed away when I was a senior in high school. So my only real support was him when he died. When he died, before he died, two weeks before he died, he called me to his bedside. And he said to me, and I don't know why, because up until that point, other than, you know, because even though I did bad in school, I loved life. I thought I was enjoying life pretty well. Just loved having fun, I guess. Up until that point, you know, everything was fine. And I wonder why he, he called me to his bedside and he says to me, Bobby, I want to tell you something. No matter how hard it gets in this life, no matter how tough you think it is, there's never, ever a good enough reason to take your life. I was like, oh, wait, where did that come from? Like, I wasn't feeling that way. I wasn't really depressed. Yeah, I wasn't happy, but I wasn't depressed. Almost three years later, I'm depressed. I'm driving down the road. Three in the morning. Coming home from some bar somewhere, drunk. Just wanting to end it all. And this voice comes to me, and it literally comes to me in my ear and says, just swerve over it. And now I'm driving. Everything's going like this. It was the grace of God I made it home that night. I don't know how I drove ten feet. But this voice comes to me and says, just swerve over and hit that tree. And I just... And I started, and all of a sudden, at the same right as soon as I heard that voice, I heard my dad's voice loud and clear in my ear say, there's never a good enough reason to take your life. Wow. And I cried myself home. I cried myself to sleep. God gave my dad wisdom to say what I needed to hear years before. I don't know why God just gave it. If God had not given that to him. Now, do I think my dad literally talked to my ear? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know everything. But God allowed me to hear his voice again by the Holy Spirit. That's the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. When you have Christ in your life and the Holy Spirit in your life, he will rescue you from uncertain tragedy. And he did. And believe it or not, that same exact thing happened another time, twice. Same thing, driving down the road, hear the voice, boom, it moaned, you know, it's pulled away. I couldn't believe it. I was like, wow. Made it home. You know, I was, not too long after that, I was in a bar, hung out with a friend of mine, came home from college, and he's celebrating, wanting me to celebrate with him. Give me this drink, and that drink, and that, and I'm just like, and my old girlfriend there, not the same one, another one, another old girlfriend, huh? I walk over to her and say hi, and she says hi, and she walks away, and her girlfriend is with her and says, you need to get out of here, Billy's here. Well, Billy was this girl's new boyfriend, actually. And this guy was such an evil person, he actually took a wind, a, a baseball bat to her dad's windshield open, a tab of actually, he had, busted it up. The whole family was afraid of him. The brother actually approached me one time and asked me to kill him. <laughs> he says, I'll pay you. I'll pay you if you get rid of him. That's how bad this dude was. So this dude's in there. I, I, I'm drunk. I, I walk out the door. I, he, he comes out of the bathroom, push me up against the wall, and goes, you and me, come on. Oh, my God. I said, come on. I walk out the door. The last thing I saw was the doorknob. And his arm went around my head, and he started hitting me. And we're out in the ice and the snow, and we're rolling around. It's the first time I was ever in a fight where I'm trying to defend myself, but I couldn't kick or punch or nothing. And we're rolling, rolling. We end up around the corner, down around the bend. No one else is out there. Everybody else is in there carrying on in the bar. My buddies are in there. And all of a sudden, he's on, he gets on top of me, and he grabs me by the ears, and he reaches down, and he bites my forehead, literally pulls the skin off my forehead. I felt it snap. And I thought, in that moment, I thought, I'm going to be, have a hole in my head the rest of my life. He was a dirty fighter. I just started... And he had eight fingers in the eyes. I tried. I got on top of him, and then next thing I know, he's on top of me again. And we're in the alleyway, in this dark alleyway, and he gets me right here. He gets me right here. And I start to black out. 
I can't move. He's got me pinned down. He's literally killing me. I literally saw his face, and then I saw no more. It was black. And I knew in that moment I was dying. And all of a sudden, I hear these voices. There they are. There's somebody, now again, the Holy Spirit, even then, was watching out for me. Somebody quickened my friend inside and said, where's he at? And they noticed that he was gone too. And they put two and two together and said, oh, no. And they came out, and I heard footsteps running down the sidewalk. And they pulled him off of me, and instantly I could see again. I was that close, guys, to dying. Because I made poor choices in my life. I didn't follow wisdom. I didn't follow what God said. I was a mess. I was a mess. I was a perfect project for God. <laughs> you know, something to do on a day when he's not so busy, maybe. I don't know. But I was. I was a mess. And um, that's, that's just some of it. That's some of my story. About a year later, I'm dating some other girl who we dated on and off for three three times, and she'd break up with me, I'd break up, whatever. And one day, I, she was on vacation, she came home, I knew she was coming home, I called her on the phone, and she said, she just acted like she didn't care. Does it sound like a week in there? She doesn't even want to talk to me. I hang up the phone, this, that's it. I'm, this is the last time I'm, I don't want to, and my buddy, my close friend, my closest friend, who just recently moved away to West Virginia, that Wednesday before, his old girlfriend came to me, who I didn't like, I didn't like this girl. <laughs> I didn't even want him dating her, but <clears throat> she comes to me and said, hey, if I get my mom's car on Sunday, can you drive? I said, yeah, I can't drive all the way to West Virginia. I'm like, nah, because I didn't want anything to do with her. Well, this Friday comes along, I'm talking to this, old girl, this girlfriend on Hamilton, and all of a sudden, this girl's name comes to mind. I get on the phone, I cry. I said, you still want to go on Sunday? I just want to go. She said, yeah, I'm going to come. I'm going to bring a friend of mine. Nah, you don't understand. I don't want any friends. You're going to see Chuck. I'm going to see Chuck. You know? And that's what we're going to do. You get, I'm going to see him for 20 minutes, half hour, and then you guys can run off and do whatever you want. He said, sometimes, you know how sometimes you just need a best friend you know, to talk to, you know what I mean? And, and it's good to have a good friend or somebody that you can go to, you know. And that's, that was Chuck, you know. I, I, and I had to drive there, so I drove there. And in the back seat, this girl sitting in the back seat, and she's looking like she's paranoid because she thinks I'm going to crash the car or something. I don't know what was going on. So we get there. I get to meet this girl. We start talking and this and that. Long story short, she was my first wife. When I quit looking, whenever I gave up on life, I met her. The funny thing is, these guys knew her. They know Brenda. The funny thing is, Brenda, she got away from God. She was raised in the Pentecostal church of praise and women's Christian life. She knew God. She knew the word, but she got away from God for a time. But the crazy thing is, if she had never gotten away from God... I'd have never met her. I'd have never met her. And I thought many times over the years that God loved her enough and he loved me enough to bring us on that broken road that we were on together. You know? And we dated for a while and then she got pregnant. And we decided to get married. We got married. Three months later, I'm still drinking. I come home one night drunk. She started crying. I said, we need to start talking to each other, communicating. We need to go to church. I'm not just learning my word. We need to go to church. So that following Saturday, I'm up ironing clothes, getting ready to go to church, to my church, the Methodist church I was raised in, which I thought was pretty cool, cool church. They never gave me a tassel. They never told me I had to be saved. <laughs> um, second week, I'm ironing my clothes. I'd ask her every week, you want to go to church? No. Nah. Third week, I was going to go. Fourth week, you want to go to church? She goes, you know what? I've been thinking about it. You have? She says, if one condition, if you go to my church. I said, no. Okay. So I already left that church. So I always remember the red door. <laughs> so this building is an old school, right? Over in Soul and Beaver in, in Kingsport. It had, and the corner was kind of, you know, like sideways like this. And the door was right on the corner. You go up a couple steps, it's a red door. It was a brown brick building, maybe, or something, but it had a red door. And I remember walking up those steps, and here I am, all of the wisdom that I own. I go, that's okay, God. I heard about these churches. I won't be back here again. Imagine that. I'm trying to tell God. I won't be back there. I heard about these churches. She told me later on, she kept looking. The music was going. She kept looking to see if I was still there. She thought maybe I got up and bolted, you know. But, uh, 
Okay. Stuck it out. We went and got in the car. I said, what was that? I said, what? What kind of music? It's like electric guitars, drums. We have an organ in our church. Like, what's that? She goes, well, when we go home, I'll show you. She was so subtle. She's a woman. She would not talk a lot of words. But she would get things done. She would say, we'll go home. I'll show you. So we get home. Okay. We're home. We get to home. I think I read all of the Psalms. I think I just told you guys this, didn't I? I think I read all the Psalms that night. Oh, what? Raise your hands, stringed instruments, drums. Like, what? I said, what's going on? So I, next week I was going, I said, hey, you want to go back to your church? <laughs> I said, yeah, let's go. We go to our church. So I get in there. Worship's going. It's pretty cool. All of a sudden, I hear somebody speaking another language. Tell a person to calm down over there. And then I heard somebody like interpreting what they were saying. It was good. Wow. I go, we in the church. I get in the car. I go, what's that? <laughs> yes, we go home. Show you. <laughs> Guess what book she opened up here? She opens up the Acts, the book of Acts. Again, I think I read Acts all night. I couldn't stop reading. I went back the third week. Pastor mm-hmm. preached on hell, fire. Brimstone. I think that was actually the title of his message. Pastor Rowan. And I was not leaving there before I put my face at that altar. I got down to that altar. I said, Lord, I'm messed up. I've been missing this. They didn't help me where I was before. They didn't help me in the school. They didn't help me in church. I need you, Lord. And I gave my life to him. I gave up. And I walked out that door. And everything was different. I quit cussing. I quit drinking. Everything was different. That moment, I walked out the door, and I, I just felt it. I knew it. I was born again like that. Everything that I knew that I thought was right was wrong. And everything I thought was so weird and wrong was right. I knew it immediately. And I understand not everybody has that kind of experience. Some people come to the Lord because they hear the word. Because faith comes by hearing the word. You know, you, you hear the word and say, okay, God, I'm going to have to trust your word. I'm going to follow you. And they learn, and you learn. Well, most of us do learn that way. But as we trust him, as we learn, we change. But there are some people in that moment, right then, like that, like me, like, boom, I'm done. Now, <laughs> I'm in the word. Every day, I'm like, What's, what else is in there? I don't know. Story after story, and and testimony after testimony and lives being changed and we're going to talk about that like why there's so many stories in the bible about like you know young people and old people that serve god that trusted god now i'm just going to refer to some of my notes like jeremiah okay jeremiah was an amazing prophet he was called by god to be a prophet okay and he was called by god to warn israel okay they didn't heed. A lot of bad stuff happened. And they were overtaken. And then years and years later, they finally missed it. Jeremiah did some amazing things. You get a chance, read God's word, read about Jeremiah, his whole story. But it's amazing. But here's the thing. Jeremiah was called by God. He was, most people believe he was only like 17 years old. And he says to God, God, I can't speak to people. They're not going to believe me. They're not going to trust me. I'm a kid. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a youth. He said, don't say that you're a youth. You will go to whom I send you, and you will say what I tell you to say. Jeremiah was faithful, and he trusted God. And even though the people didn't heed his word and didn't listen to him at first, he became an amazing, amazing prophet in history in the Bible. I mean, I mean you know, story, story after story, there's, there's people in the, in, in the Bible like Esther, like David. You know David, right? How David started. Shepherd boy, 15 years old, maybe, right? Yeah, 15 years old. Maybe, maybe, yeah, right? I, I don't think him because I, he better know that because he'll be a pastor. <laughs> yeah, David, you know, and David goes to the king, you know, and there's a giant, like everybody's afraid of this giant. David goes up to this king, he, says, he tries to put his arm on, he can't tell his heavy arm, he's a kid, throws it off. The king's not even going to send him, but then he says, you know, David says, hey, a bear came and tried to kill my sheep. I killed the bear. 
And I'm, a lion came and tried to kill my sheep. I killed the lion. And he said, go ahead. And you know the rest of the story. David takes out his sling, guided by the Holy Spirit, one stone, boom. You know? Right? David, 15 years old. Joseph is another one. Joseph was young. He was probably about 17. He starts having dreams. God just starts giving him dreams. Dreams about how he's going to be a leader and his brothers are going to serve him. Well, they didn't want to hear that. <laughs> he was the youngest in the family. Are you telling us? We're gonna, no, we're not bowing down to you. They actually tried to kill him. They, they sold him off and he ends up in Egypt. You know, Read the story if you don't know it. It's an amazing story. Right? But he goes on to do great things and rescues his people during a time of famine because God's wisdom is in him and God shows him what to do to store up food for the nation. It's amazing. But he was a kid. Esther was a very, very young woman. You ever hear of Esther? You read about Esther yet? Amazing. Esther is like, she's like probably the best, to me, the best example for a young woman in the Bible. So she takes, she marries at a very young age. She marries this queen of Persia, right? Persia. Queen of Persia. And there were these people that wanted to destroy Israel. They wanted to annihilate the Jews. So these couple men are like connived. They, they, they kind of planned this thing. Esther gets wind about it. She knows what's going on. She goes to the king and through God's wisdom and grace, long story short, convinces the king. Not only were her people left alone, they were raised up and treated with dignity and respect. And those guys that tried to do them in, that plotted against them, they were hung. Amazing story. Other women in the Bible, Mary, mother of Jesus, right? Right? You can't leave her out. Think who else is there? Um, yeah, Miriam, she was the sister of Moses. She played a big role. Uh, you know, just so many people, you know. Um, so no matter how old you are and you're young, God wants to use you. He really does. You know, and I mentioned before how we're all formed, you know. I think we're all really formed for a specific purpose. Every one of you guys, you might not know it now. I didn't know it. Sure, I didn't know it when I was your age. You might not know it now, but God created you for a purpose, a specific purpose. And sometimes it's disguised. Right now it's disguised as students. You're a student, right? But inside, if you're willing you trust God and you read his word and let him guide you, you're a minister. Every one of us should be ministers of the gospel. So you're disguised as a student. Later on in life, you might be a nurse, a banker, a factory worker like me, disguised, but ministers. So not everybody's called to be a PJ, right? He was definitely called, right, to be a pastor. But what his calling is a high calling. What his calling is, is to produce fruit. But there might be other pastors in the group. Right? See, if PJ wasn't here, you might have come. But you might not have, you might, it might not have happened for you. So, you know, there is something special about each one of you guys. I want you to know that. And just like my dad told me, there's never a good enough reason. Don't ever think about that. Don't ever. God loves you. And whatever comes your way, if it's bad, trust in God. Because he can even take the bad things, and he can make something good out of it. He can turn it around for his good and for his glory. That's what he wants to do. He loves doing that, and he loves using us to accomplish things. You know, Jesus said, I'm going away, but I, I have to go away. It's advantageous for you if I do, because if I don't, then the comforter won't come. That person won't come that will help you and he told us we'd do greater things than even him. If you can imagine that. In greater numbers. I mean, in, in there's another verse here that I have. John 10, 10. Easy one to remember. Um, where the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But Jesus said, I've come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. So he not only wants to give you a good life, he wants to give you an abundant life. 
mostly, not necessarily money. If money comes with it and he trusts you with it and you can handle it, I'll be honest with you guys, I couldn't. <laughs> if I'd have had money when I was early, young, I'd have probably been a worse mess. But he comes to give us abundant life. And that life, he wants to give us joy and peace. That's, that's one of the biggest reasons you should want to serve God as a youth, for the joy and the peace that he'll give you in any situation. I don't care if it's you've lost a loved one. I don't care if you're struggling in school. I don't care if you're getting picked on. You can go to God, and he can change things. He can, he can help you when you trust him. He always knows best. He always knows best for, for us. He knows best more than we know for ourselves. And one thing I know, he's taken, he's taken the bad things in my life and turned them around for joy, for good. You know? Like when I think about how I was going to kill myself twice, then I met my wife, my first wife, and she gave me two beautiful kids. I love my kids. A daughter and a son. They both have four. My daughter has all boys. My son has a boy and two girls. And uh, it, it's amazing. It's amazing the joy and, that comes with that. As you grow older and become a parent, have kids and grand. Hey, I just became a great grandparent. <laughs> my my oldest grandson. I don't know if I told you guys. I know, right? So I got to see him the other day. It's three weeks later, but I got to see the baby. Oh, my gosh. And, and I'm standing there, and it's just a joy. It's the fruit of living for God and trusting in Him and loving Him. He'll bring such joy to your life in ways that you can't even fathom. Just trust Him. Trust me when I tell you, you don't want to go down the path I went down. You don't want to say, you know what, you did, I, I'll be fine. No. There's no guarantee. There's no guarantee. God had something planned for me. He has, he has plans for my kids and my grandkids. He saw them way before I was married. And I see my grand. I see them now. I see them all involved in ministry, doing things for God, serving God. That's fruit from me and me teaching them the right way to go. For me turning my life over to God. And then their kids are going to grow and they're going to have babies and they're going to do the same thing. Raise their kids in church and teach them, Jesus is coming soon. Get ready. There's no greater pleasure that a father can have than that. So you guys have to know, you know, um, there's, a, there's, there's one thing here that I, I want to read. And it's out of... Um, it's 1 Timothy 4.12. It says, let no one despise your youth. Now, I love what the New Living Translation is, which is what you have there. It actually says, don't let anyone think less of you. So just because you're young and you feel like you're caught, you want to do something to help, or just, don't, let, don't let anybody say, you know what, you can't, you're not experienced enough. You're not, you don't know enough. No, don't let people do that to you. You be confident. Tell them, no, I want to do this. I know I need to do this. So don't, that's what that verse means, is that don't despise your youth, but be an example to the believers in the world in conduct, in love, in spirit, in faith, and in purity. Keep yourself pure, pure for God. And you can serve God by obeying, obeying your parents. That's, that's, like, that's like number one. And, it, and I don't know what home life is like for all you guys. Some, some of us I know here have been here didn't, don't have a dad or don't have a mom or whatever. But if you do, man, serving God starts at home. Because let's say you don't have the best relationship with your mom and dad. Let's say you might want them to start coming to church. Let your light shine. As you trust in God, as you live for Him, and He gives you joy, obey your parents, do what they ask you to do, and do it gratefully with a smile on your face and say, thanks, Mom, thanks, Dad. Hey, is there anything else I can do for you before I leave? They'll be like, who is this kid? Like, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So do that. And that's the, you can start right there by, by doing that. But we want to also avoid sinful natures of thoughts and words and deeds and stuff. And 
along with those things, those kind of things of sexual immorality, lust, drugs, and alcohol, evil desires, and all other vices. They will be your demise. They, they, those things will just destroy you. They almost did me. And finally, I want to just say one more time, just trust God in all situations, in the good and in the bad. But there are two quick stories I want to tell. There is, um, we were just talking about Billy Graham, right? So Billy Graham, I don't know, who knows who Billy Graham was? Okay, Billy Graham is probably, I want to say he's arguably the greatest evangelist of our modern time. I mean, he, he was out there in the 70s doing the thing, you know, preaching to people and gathering huge crowds. I was telling these guys, I was watching a little short video of him in 1973 going over to, uh, going over to, I think it was, it was in India, Korea, he went to Korea. And at that time, people in Korea, they were hungry for God. They wanted to know more about God. Billy Graham shows up. One million people from Korea showed up. And they knew there was going to be a big crowd. They've had crowds of half a million, whatever. They had this huge, huge, giant field. A lot of it was paved and whatever. And they, they had it all marked off for where people could walk in and go sit. And stand. People were standing up the whole time. Like there was wall-to-wall -wall people. One million people. While he preached the truth, and then an interpreter would interpret it. He'd say a word, the interpreter would say a word. He'd say a word. Billy Graham, one of my favorites of all time. Amazing. You can always look at videos of him, teachings. His message is the message, the message of the gospel, truth, peace, salvation. It's not too old for you guys. It's right on. He's right on. So check Billy Graham out when you can. But the thing I want to tell you about Billy Graham is this. It's crazy. Two little boys, young boys, probably about your age, maybe 16, I don't know, walk into a church. They go to this church and they hear there's going to be a bunch of people there. They go in. It's There's no seats. They can't sit anywhere. They're looking around. There's no no seats anywhere. It was a big church. I don't know, maybe it was a couple hundred people. I don't know. But it was, it was, they couldn't sit. So they start walking out. We're talking about serving God, right? Even at a young age. There was an usher. There was an usher standing there. Notice these boys walk in. And notice I'm looking for a seat, and notice they couldn't find one, notice they walked out. This usher went out the door after them and said, hey, hey, guys, come here. Come here, I'm going to find you a seat. You come with me. He walked them in, sat them down, and he taught them to preach. They gave their, these two boys gave their life to Jesus that day. One of them was Billy Graham. You think that usher has any reward in heaven for being obedient? For just being willing to serve God. God, I can't do anything. I, I don't have any skills. I can't sing. I can't play an instrument, I, I'm not very good with my hands, there's nothing I can do, but God, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be an usher, God, maybe I'll be an usher. I'll, I'll take the plate up and collect the offering. I'll invite these boys back in. <laughs> you know? It's crazy. Do you know who Israel Houghton is? Houghton? He, he's, he's amazing. We do a lot of his music. We've done music with him. I can't think of anything right off the top of my head right now, but he is amazing. Israel Houghton just, he not only is a minister with song, he's a minister, he's a, he's a, he's a pastor now. He's like, I was watching some videos on him, and he's just like talking to people about God and just creating this huge, he's reaching out to people. One of the things that he said that sticks in my mind, he says it's not about us. It's never been about us, never been about me. It's always been about them. It's been about people serving God by serving people. He's such a humble man. It's, it's amazing. And yet God's given him this great skill in music to write music and sing music like nobody else and play guitar like nobody else. There's a woman standing on the corner one day. She's pregnant. And she's strung out on drugs. And across the street there's this Christian woman from a local church. She sees this girl across the street. And she's God says, go talk to her. Trusting God, God guides it. Go, go talk to him. See, a lot of times people, I, I'm in a hurry. I got, I got to get back. Check this out. I got to get back to the church, man. The church they need me there. I got to get up and play guitar, <laughs> right? I got a lesson to teach tonight. I got to get there. I got to usher or whatever. I, I don't want to be late. She'll be fine, God. I pray somebody else will take care of it. No, you know what? That's what we do. 
I'm ashamed to say it. I'm, I'm guilty. I'm guilty of being so busy and so rushed to get down to the church to do God's work that his work was right out there on the street. I didn't even know it. I did. Recently, not longer, I failed. Big time. I'm still looking for that guy. This is a street person. I'm still looking for him. And you better guarantee, I don't care if my wife needs me home. I don't care if I'm going somewhere. I don't care if I have to get to the airport. Uh uh-uh. uh. If I see this guy, I'm talking with him. This lady walks across the street to this girl who's pregnant and strung out on drugs. She, she says, all she says to her is, Do you know Jesus loves you? And she starts crying. Jesus doesn't love me. No, he loves you. He loves you so much. You just know he loves you. And it goes on. And the conversation continues and it goes on. She decides not to have an abortion. Her son is Israel. One of the most amazing Christian artist on the planet and minister of the gospel. You just don't know. You could have done that. You could have felt put on your heart. You could have said, excuse me, I'm so sorry. I got this person. I just want to ask you a question. Do you know Jesus? Do you know he loves you? And you know what's going to happen most of the time? I um, If it's the right time, then God might just be testing you to see how many times you'll do it and fail before you do it, and it's right. But you could have done that. Any one of you could have done that. You could have went up and talked to this girl and got her talking. And you know what happens? When you're reading God's Word and you're praying, all of a sudden, <laughs> the Word starts coming up, like stuff starts coming out of your face. <laughs> like, and you walk away and you go, where did I come from? I don't even know how I said that stuff. I don't even remember what I said. People get saved like trusting God. You're just trusting Him with everything in you. You're saying, God, I don't care if I'm going to be humiliated. I don't care if I'm going to look embarrassed. I stood one time. It was a bad accident. I was with my wife and the kids. And I, this is years ago, pulled the car off the side of the road. I got out of the car. I said, come on, guys. Where are we going? We're going to pray for you. We don't know what's going on. They're carrying somebody off with a gurney. They could be dying. We don't know what's going on. We're going to pray. We stood there on the street Stretch your hands. So stretch your hands out now. My wife was bold, and she was subtle, but she could do things. She was even like, ah. no. <laughs> we all stood there, and I could hear a neighbor sitting on the porch laughing at us. Laughing at us. I didn't care, because first of all, they didn't know me from Adam. I didn't know them. I didn't let them bother me a bit. I just said, Lord, don't know what's going on. Don't know if somebody's dying, God, or whatever it is. Whatever it is, God, you, you, you be with them, Lord. And I guarantee, I, I know the prayer of faith, that, that prayer, prayer of faith, I, I know, I don't know, I never followed them up to the hospital. I really believe that something changed. That God put me in that spot for a purpose. Because those ones sitting on the porch weren't doing it. They were just going to be spectators. They were just going to watch. But I was detoured and ended up there. Don't ever think that you don't have a purpose, that God can't use you. He can use you any given day. And when you trust him and you give your heart to him and you ask the Holy Spirit to come into your heart, that Holy Spirit will reside in you and live in you and talk to you and speak to you and direct to you. And you have it within every one of you, not only to change your own life and to change somebody else's life, but I'm telling you, you have it within you to change the culture. The culture at your school. The culture in your city. You might not feel like it now. You might feel like it's the same. I can't, I, I can't do all this. It's not that big, guys. There's nothing too big for God. God is wanting to use you and I just know that he has a purpose for each one of you guys. And when, getting back to really what this series is about, you don't need to go through the things I went through to have some kind of testimony like, wow, God survived being dead. <laughs> you don't have to. But your testimony is as simple as this. It can be 10 years from now. God loved me so much that he kept me from all kinds of stuff that I hear other people doing and see the trouble people are getting in. And God loved me so much that he 
brought me to that church, and he let me listen to PJ, and I learned, and I learned that I needed to trust him, and that's, that could be, that to me, that's the greatest testimony, is you can walk away and say, I never took a drink, I never did drugs, I never got involved with that crowd. Now, some of you, I don't know, last thing I'll say, some of you may have heard me tell a story about my daughter when she was 15. We had moved back from Ohio, and um, she met a friend at school. And this friend, I walked by my daughter's bedroom, and she was better best friend. I walked by my daughter's bedroom one night, I hear her crying, her door's cracked, I hear her crying, she was on the phone, you know, I, I, I got two kids, it's crazy, what's going on, she just, she wouldn't, she looked at me, but she just kept talking to whoever on the other end, she let me stand her, she didn't shoot me away, so I stood there, I want to know what's going on, and I hear her saying, Amanda, if, if you don't, if that's what you're going to do, and she's crying, if that's what you're going to do, I, I, I can't. I, I have to, I love you. And I will always be here for you. When you want to call me, when you want to talk, if you ever want to, I'm here. But I have to break ties with you. I'm not doing this. She's the only friend my daughter has. Other kids have picked on her. And they, 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 they gave her a hard time. My daughter hung up the phone. I didn't even know what it was all about. <laughs> she tells her dad. She wanted me to go this weekend with her at a sleepover to experiment with boys. Boys. And I said, no. I said, I'm saving myself for the man that God has for me. later, we were already going to a church, but there was nobody there their age, and we had heard about praise assembly, and how the youth group there was amazing, and the people there that led their youth group, great people, good stuff, so we went there the next week, within the next, she met all these kids, I became such good friends with her, a lot of the girls, and a many guys, you know, I think within the first few months we were there, she met her husband. She met Morgan there. She, she met Morgan. Morgan gave her, he's giving her a great life. And he's a good man. And they decided to marry. I said, you know, they were going to elope. I said, you know, a while later, you know, years later, a couple years, they were 18, 19. And they wanted to elope. And I said, look, if you're going to do this, you need to get a job. Because <laughs> you really did have a good job. He said, I will, sir, I will, I promise you. Guy, I love my son-in-law. He went out and he did a job. I won't even go into detail of the job. He, he had a dirty job, six years, hard, dirty. Had to wear a uniform and a respirator, and came home dirty every day. He did that for his family, for my daughter, for his kids. I mean, my utmost respect for him. My daughter says, "No, I don't care if I don't have any." My one friend wants me to do things I do not want to do and I don't think God wants me to do. So she trusted God's word. She got wisdom and she understood and she said, no, God, I don't trust you. You're not a man. You're not a God that you'll lie to me. You can tell me if I trust you, you're going to take care of me. And he sure did. They had a wonderful life together. I was at a wedding this past weekend where it was there, uh, my, my son-in-law's sister got married, and uh, my, well, my daughter, and some of the amazing faith, most people just don't leave a job, and said, I'm going to start this business, <laughs> like, what are you doing? He worked for FedEx and UPS, he was a hard worker, carrying packages, running every day, winter time, Christmas time, all the busy season, he did that for I don't know how many years, and then one day, and, but he loved media stuff, he loved photography and videoing and stuff. And it's a very competitive industry, but they said, we don't care because we have God on our side. And he quit. One day they talked, they decided, they prayed, they 
quit his job. They didn't have a lot of money in the bank. He quit his job, immediately started working, looking at you know what weddings he can do and this and that. And that's what they were doing at the wedding I was at. I got to see them in action, you know, walking out of the chambers and doing all this. <laughs> then I see all the stuff they edit it, you know, and how they do it. Um, but yeah, he uh, they, they just amazing. So then at church, the church they go to, all of a sudden they meet this guy who's this like millionaire. This guy just happens to own like a big electrical company of some kind. Hey Morgan, I was wondering, I noticed you guys with cameras and stuff, like you do weddings, things like that, and I know what you're doing. Yeah. He goes, what would you think about doing some work for me? This guy hired my son in law and daughter to do his media guy. Like he does videos and movies, like all kind of stuff for their for this guy. He pays him really well. And on top of that, they do the weddings and that, and then then later on they get another big contract with another big company. They're doing far greater than the average person that's out there doing weddings and parties. And it's God. It's because they trust God. So, that's all I want to say is that you guys, every one of you guys are young now. Yeah, but you know what? God can use you. He wants to use you. And you will, through the light, through, through the things that you're going to do the next few years, as you go through high school and then into college, you're going to see God's hand in your life. Like Tanner, he, did, he gave his testimony last week. He's a great example of someone who didn't know what he was doing. So he just laid it down to God, right? He said, here it is, God. you got to show me this. He got, to, he got obedient. He started reading God's word, right? And he started praying. He committed to that. Guess what God does when you commit to that? <laughs> he does things you can never keep on your wallet. Yeah. God, God is good. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for this evening, for the time that I've had to speak to all these young people, Lord. And I ask, God, that with each and every one of them, that you would, you would begin to show them, God, in their hearts the things that you want them to do, Lord. And that you would guide them, Lord. As you birth in each one of them a passion for something, it, it might be a career choice, Lord, or whatever it is, God, but show them their purpose, Lord. But more than anything, show them that their purpose is to serve you, to love you, to live for you, to become like Christ, and to be ambassadors for you, Lord, to a lost and dying and hurting world. And Lord, we just thank you and praise you. I know, Lord, as you've worked in my life, as you're working in Tanner's life, Lord, I know, God, that you'll work in their lives. And I just ask for your spirit to go with them, even in their sleep, God. Give them dreams, God, and let them know that you have your hand on them. And we love you, God. We know that through these lives, young lives, Lord, will come great testimonies. Testimonies of your goodness and your mercy and grace. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, small group. This is a small group, so we're not really splitting up. But I really didn't have any questions prepared. But it's like open to the floor. <laughs> Just for a few minutes, if you guys want to. If there's something that sticks out in your mind more than anything that maybe you can take away, um, anything you want to ask, whatever, or you just want pizza, <laughs> it's going to get pizza. <laughs>